This is Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video covers lectures 15 to 16 in Seminar 2. These two lectures contain Lacan's examination of Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Purloined Letter. It's one of Lacan's most famous analyses, but notoriously difficult to understand. What it reveals, however, is nothing less than the workings of the unconscious itself. We're shown how the chain of signifiers composing the symbolic order gives rise to something irreducible to conscious intentions, something beyond the ego. Let's keep this in mind as it will orient us to what can be a confusing discussion on probability and number theory. As we move through this analysis, we'll come to appreciate why this section has figured so centrally for readers of Lacan. Also, keep in mind that I'm primarily drawing from the version found in Seminar 2. You can find a revised version of the text in the Acre, which includes sections from talks given much later. In this video, I'll address the following questions. 1. What is the purloined letter? 2. How does Lacan use the game of odds and evens mentioned in the story to demonstrate the workings of the unconscious? And 3. How does this game and the function of the purloined letter inform psychoanalytic interpretation? This channel addresses works of philosophy and psychoanalysis. Each video, structured by three questions, analyzes a small section as we gradually move through an entire text. To support this work, please consider liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. You can also support this work on Patreon. Link is below in the description. One evening, the baffled prefect of the Parisian police visits Dupont to consult with him about a troubling case. If you are familiar with Sherlock Holmes, you would recognize the dynamic played out between the two characters, especially as the story is generally recognized to have been the inspiration for author Conan Doyle's stories. The determined but conventional prefect tells the dispassionate, shrewd Dupont that a letter written by the queen has been stolen by the minister. Though the letter's content is never disclosed, we're informed that it's of great importance as the information it contains would be quite damaging to the queen's reputation should it be made known to the king. The prefect explains that the theft happened while the queen was interrupted and hastily placed the letter out in the open on a table. The minister then enters and seizes it, leaving another similar looking letter in its place, all of which was witnessed by the queen who couldn't say anything for fear of disclosing the letter's importance to others. The prefect has been asked to retrieve the letter using the utmost discretion. Yet, despite months of searching the minister's residence, the letter has not been retrieved. A month following the initial conversation, the prefect visits Dupont again. Upon indicating that the prefect is willing to give his share of the reward to whoever finds it, Dupont proceeds to produce the very letter. After the shocked prefect departs, Dupont explains the situation to his friend who is present. Dupont tells the story of a schoolboy who often succeeded at the game of evens and odds, in which a playing partner guesses whether the number of marbles held in the hand are of an even or odd number. The schoolboy had some principles aiding him in his success, basing his choices on the perceived intellect and cunning of his opponent. The smarter the opponent, the more variations the schoolboy ran through in his mind to guess odd or even in the next round. To identify the opponent's intellect, the schoolboy would form specific facial expressions that mirrored the others and see what kind of thoughts and feelings arose. This provided the necessary insight into his opponent's mental prowess, allowing him to correctly guess odd or even. Dupont took such an approach to the minister, the minister who is no fool and knew that the police would assiduously search his residence, hid the letter in plain sight. Upon visiting the minister and during a distraction manufactured by Dupont, he takes the original letter, replacing it with a similar looking one. The game of even and odds described by Dupont in the Purloin letter presents a situation in which, on each occasion, there is a 50% chance of correctly guessing the outcome. As is the case for games of chance, 
prior results have no bearing on future results. This fact meets up with the resistance of a cognitive bias known as the gambler's fallacy, where individuals come to believe that a prior flip of the coin or a roll of the die has some bearing on the next flip or roll. This cognitive bias is responsible for the belief in the so-called hot hand. If I flipped tails five times in a row, I might wrongly assume that the next flip is more likely to be heads due to an assumption that probability of this kind should yield a mixture of heads and tails. Yet a basic understanding of probability shows that future flips remain unchanged regardless of the result of prior flips. However, the situation changes when the symbol is introduced, giving rise to a set of possibilities irreducible to probability. Lacan has us imagine a machine built in such a way that it responds to a question, such as whether I have an even or odd number in hand, or what I'll now call a plus or a minus. If I have a plus in hand and the machine guesses a minus, it loses, and I press the button on the machine indicating that it was wrong. Let's also say that the machine is programmed in such a way that after a few trials, it will begin to base its own response on the pattern of previous outcomes. The machine's decision has nothing to do with the psychology of the opponent. It's a purely computational decision dictated by previous outcomes. Now remember, at the level of the real, past rounds should have no bearing on future rounds. It's always a 50-50 probability on every round. To make sense of what happens next, I'll draw from Bruce Fink's essay found in a commentary on Seminars 1 and 2. It offers an in-depth clarification of what Lacan tersely describes in these lectures. I will also use my own example rather than the ones provided by Lacan or Fink to illustrate that the rules work regardless of the combination of outcomes. I've created a set of outcomes based on 18 rounds using a random numbers generator, labeling the outcome with either a plus or minus, depending on whether the number is even or odd. Here you can see I have 8 pluses and 10 minuses. At this point, we remain at the level of probability. Now let's see what happens when we impose symbols that organize these numbers into distinct groupings of three outcomes. If the groups of three are identical, if they are all pluses or all minuses, they're assigned the number one. If the groups of three display an alternating pattern of plus minus plus or minus plus minus, then they're assigned the number three. Finally, if no discernible pattern is found in a group of three, they're assigned the number two. Along with assigning these numbers to consecutive groups of three, we can then assign them to every outcome, taking the last two outcomes of the previous sequence and including the new third outcome. So starting with the third round, every outcome is assigned a number category. Already we can observe that an unintended restriction emerges from this symbolic structuring. It's impossible for a three to immediately follow a one or a one to immediately follow a three there must be a two between them. All other combinations are possible. In the Acree, Lacan provides this visual demonstration of the rules that have emerged. Next, another layer of symbolic structuring is added. This time, a letter is assigned to groups of three numbers, producing a second order grouping. Lacan uses Greek letters, but I'll apply Roman letters instead here. Groupings with a one or three at the beginning and the end of the chain are assigned an A. Groupings beginning with a 1 or 3, but ending in a 2, are assigned a B. Groupings that begin and end with a 2 are assigned a C. And groupings that begin with a 2 and end with a 1 or 3 are assigned a D. The middle outcome can be any number. Having assigned every possible combination, we can go ahead and apply a letter symbol under each number. What we discover, as we did with the first symbolic structure, is that only certain sequences are possible. The letters A and D can be followed by any letter, but the letter immediately after that must be an A or B. The letters C and B are immediately followed by any letter, but the letter after that must be either a C or a D. Consequently, the combinations of ABD or BDA are impossible. This is a residual effect of the first symbolic ordering in which it was impossible for threes and ones to immediately follow one another. 
This demonstration underscores a couple of points. First, it shows how a symbolic system carries within it a set of unarticulated laws that establishes possibility and impossibility in a manner not contained within probability. Nor are the laws conceived in terms of causality any more than one would say that in the Pythagorean theorem that the hypotenuse of a right triangle is caused by the sum of the other two sides squared, or being an unmarried man somehow causes one to be a bachelor. Second, it shows how a certain kind of memory is maintained within a chain of signifiers. The memory requires no sense of self or identity to be maintained. It's a au-delà de l'ego, or a beyond of the ego. There's a retroactive effect specific to symbolic memory in which the introduction of new signifiers changes the function of prior signifiers. Repetition is also demonstrated whereby the impossibility of the past is repeated in the present in a new form. Returning to the purloin letter, Lacan notes that there are four characters at the scene of the original theft. The king, queen, minister, and the letter itself. The letter is the original radical subject, Lacan says, performing a role parallel to the formula for trimethylamine in Freud's dream of Irma's injection discussed in the previous video. The other characters in the story are put into play by the letter itself as it circulates from hand to hand. The importance of the letter is not in its meaning, which is never disclosed. Rather, it's in the letter's movement. Each character becomes defined in terms of their position vis-a-vis -vis the letter, just as each character in Freud's dream takes up a position vis-a-vis -vis the chemical formula for trimethylamine. The minister holds power over the queen in having the letter in his possession, but if the king obtained the letter, the minister's power would disappear. When the queen receives the letter back without the minister realizing he had lost it, the queen now holds the power over him so long as he does not realize she's in possession of it. The power of the numbers 1, 2, and 3, as well as the letters A, B, C, and D, has nothing to do with their meaning. They are, in fact, signifiers connected only to other signifiers without any clear signified. Their power lies in the logic of their movement, which prescribes and proscribes certain possibilities. And so this purloin letter is a metaphor for the unconscious itself, which is composed of letters working in an autonomous, automatic fashion, preserving in the present what has affected it in the past, as the present retroactively changes the past. To say the unconscious is structured like a language is not about semantics, but rather its structural features, its sequence of phonemes and syntax. It is language in a purified sense, exemplified by the symbolic transformations performed by mathematicians. In fact, I recommend the YouTube channel Number File, which demonstrates how numerical transformations carried out with exacting rigor lead to all sorts of surprising conclusions that were always implicit in the function of numbers. Psychoanalytic interpretation, then, consists of identifying the determinants of behavior by isolating the irreducible signifiers as they exchange hands among the various ego identifications that comprise the history of the subject. Engaging in such interpretation consists in positing that there is nothing random in whatever we undertake, regardless of how capricious words and actions may seem. Or, to put it as Lacan does, Une lettre arrive toujours à destination. A letter always arrives at its destination. Thank you to the following for supporting this channel on Patreon. You can become a Patreon supporter yourself if you would like by clicking on the link in the description. As always, thank you all for watching. Until next time, be well.